Okay, today we're going to be talking about receipt enhancement using image processing with Verosha and her beautiful colleague, Divian. I'm going to hand it over to you guys. Okay, perfect. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, so, like our lovely speaker MC mentioned, I'm Verosha and that's Divian. The lag is <laughs> very interesting. Um, yeah, we're both from Melio AI, and Melio AI is an ML ops based company, and we specialize in developing and deploying ML solutions into the cloud. So yeah, feel free to check us out. Okay. okay, so before we get into the actual talk, we just wanted to give you guys a very brief overview of what we'll be covering in this talk. So we're going to start off with an introduction, give you guys a background and the purpose for our particular use case, idea of POC, and then going to hand over to Devian, who's going to take you guys through an overview of how we plan on approaching the image processing portion of things. Um, but they're going to take you guys through the potential use cases and then end things off with the limitation. So kicking things off with the introduction. Now, the inception of our idea was driven by our thoughts around uncovering the possibilities for creating innovative projects from receipt food items. Um, the key focus or purpose here was the extraction of crucial information from receipt images. Now, within this talk, we're going to dive into the, the different image processing techniques. Sorry, the lag is <laughs> quite hectic. Um, yeah, we're going to dive into the various different image processing techniques that were used to transform and enhance that raw receipt image. We're then going to look at the use case applications and finally the limitations. And I'm going to hand over to Divian. Thank you, Verosha. Um, yes, so as Verosha mentioned, I'll just take us through briefly how we are going to structure and approach our slides. So when it comes to image pre-processing and working with images, one of the advantages is that you can apply and visually render and view the impact of your pre-processing technique. So that's the approach we took with how we want to structure our slides. So as you'll see in this template slide, for our application pipeline, we'll take you through the step name, which is shown on the top. On the left-hand side, we'll take you through the purpose of this technique and how it's applied to our use case, how we benefit from it. And then we'll display two images on screen. One will be the image for the image processing application. And the second image will be the image after the pre-processing application. For each slide, you'll see that the after application becomes the before application for the next pre-processing item. That way you can visually interpret what the pipe. Rosha will be starting us off with the first half of the pipeline. Okay, so before we get into the actual steps of the different techniques that we use, we're, we just wanted to give you guys an idea of some of the key libraries that we use. So we made use of the OpenCV library, and this is essentially an open source library for image processing and computer vision. We then made use of the Python imaging library, um, also known as Pillow, and this helps provide the Python interpreter with image editing capabilities. 
We also made use of PyTesseract, and this is an OCR tool which helps read and recognize text embedded images. Um, and finally, we made use of the Scikit image library. And this essentially has a collection of algorithms for image processing and computer vision. Okay, now to get into the actual steps. So one of the first things that we did was to take that raw receipt image and convert it to grayscale. Now, why convert it to grayscale? What is the purpose? Well, it helps simplify further processing as grayscale images only have one channel rather than three. As well as um, converting to grayscale is one of the initial steps uh, in image processing prior to applying other approaches such as contour detection. And you guys will see that uh, later in the slides. Okay, so in our original image block, you see that raw receipt image. Um, in the after application, you see the converted image to grayscale, so you see that resulting image. We now move on to noise reduction. So we specifically made use of the Gaussian blur. Now what is the Gaussian blur? Well, it's a smoothing filter that helps reduce noise and small details in an image. Now, smoothing or blurring is a common image processing operation used for noise reduction. Now, we've been speaking about noise, but what is noise? Well, noise refers to the unwanted and random variations in pixel values. Now, it can manifest in various different forms, such as random specs, irregular patterns, and pixel uh, variations in pixel values. Now, there are various types of noise, and just to name a few, you've got salt and pepper, and salt and pepper is essentially having light and dark pixels that are scattered throughout your image. And a really good blurring filter for that is your median blur filter. Now, like mentioned, we made use of the Gaussian blur, but what is Gaussian noise? Well, you can think of it as random fuzziness or interference that may appear within your image. So think about taking out a photo and finding tiny specks or interference within your image. Now, one way to get rid of this fuzziness is to, is to apply a blurring filter. So that's where our Gaussian blur comes in. Um, now, there are many other types of blurring filters, such as your normalized box filter, your median blur, and your bilateral filter. Now, the choice of blurring filter really comes down to your specific requirements and the type of noise that, that's present in your images. Um, and then, like you guys will see in the before application, we got that converted grayscale image. We then apply our Gaussian blur filter, and you see that resulting image in the after application. We now move on to applying a morphological transformation, very specifically dilation. But before we get into what is dilation, we want to understand what is the morphological transformation. Well, it's a set of, op of operations used to analyze and manipulate the shape. Uh, it's used to manipulate the shape um, of an object within an image. Now, this is mainly applied to binary or grayscale images, and it's often used for feature extraction, noise reduction. Um, yeah. Now, in our case, we applied um, dilation to our blurred image, so you would see that in the before and after application. And this is a good time to pause and give you the definition of dilation. So dilation is used to make regions of interest more prominent to full gas in objects. I mean, we made use of it to enhance certain features um, and to detect white regions. Okay, we then moved on to edge detection. 
we made use of the canny edge detector. Now, what is the canny edge detector? Well, it's an image processing technique for identifying edges, boundaries, and sharp transitions in images. So we applied the canny edge detector to our dilated image. So you see that in the book before and after application. Now, why did we use the canny edge detector? Well, we required precise edge localization in which the canny edge detector is known to provide. Okay, now there are other types, but the choice in the detection technique that you wanna use comes down to a number of factors such as the nature of your image, the presence of noise, and again, the specific requirements um, that you may require or need. Um, and then just a very high level overview of some of the other techniques that are on screen. And this is just to name a few, there's various others. So you've got the Sobel edge detector, and this is a simple and computationally efficient edge detection method. We've then got the Lapsian of Gaussian, and this starts off by using the Gaussian blurring filter. And it's usually used for very specific image processing techniques. Um, it's very helpful when you've got rapid intensity changes uh, within your image. Okay, and I'm now going to hand over to Divian, who's going to take you guys through the contour detection portion up until the thresholding part of the pipeline. Cool. Thank you, Varosha. So the last step that Varosha touched on was canny edge detection. And this is what we can see the application. That image is also known as a binary image. The reason for that is that there only exists two pixel intensities, which is true black and true white. In this step, we want to do contour detection. So then what is a contour? If you look at the definition of the contour on our OpenCV uh, documentation, you see that a contour can be defined as a line, which is continuous and has the same pixel intensity. So straight off of that definition, you can see that the pre-processing techniques leading up to the stage has enhanced the edges, made it ready for contour detection. Binary images are also more efficient when being applied to the canny edge detection. Hello? Oh. In this step, we make you use some CV libraries again. In first stage, we use the find contours method, which detects the contours oh, on the before application image, and then we use the open CV drop contours. The contours, we use the original image as input, which you can see in the aft application. So now that we detected contours on the image, we visually know that we're only interested in the receipt itself. How then do we interpret that and allow our application to understand that we only want to extract our region of interest which is now the receipt. Again, using OpenCV methods, we passed in a list of contours which were detected, and we sorted them by the area contained within. In this case, you see that there is quite a few edges or lines, but the contour which contains the largest area, and again, a contour is continuous, with same pixel intensities, the largest area would be the receipt itself. So after sorting that list of areas, we selected the item with the largest control, and we used the OpenCV method again, which is draw contours, and we see in our after application, there's only the receipt, which is being highlighted, and that's our region of interest. The last step, 
called perspective transformation and something many of us would know as simply cropping the image. That's basically what we did here. Given the pixel values of the contour being detected for our region of interest, we applied it to a OpenCV wrap perspective method and that extracted our region of interest image. In our final pre-processing step here, and here is where you see more of, of the, the use being done, is we applied thresholding. So when it comes to thresholding, there's three different types, and I'll explain the three and why we selected uh, our uh, use case, which is local or adaptive thresholding. So many of us may know that an image is made up of pixels, and each of the, those pixels have a value. If we being specific, it has a value ranging from 0 to 255. Now with thresholding, we want to convert back to basically a binary image filled with pixels of either value 0, which is black, or 255, which is white. In our before application, you'd see that there would be varying pixel values. So how then do we determine what the new pixel value of that position would be? Binary thresholding. In binary thresholding, you specify a single pixel value. For example, 50. And as you move through the original image, if that pixel value is either above 50 or below, or below 50, the new pixel value is binary set to either 0 or 255. The issue with binary threshold is that you specify only one threshold value. So in an image which has uneven lighting, the thresholding may be applied well on, for example, the bottom of the image, but where there's more lighting, your threshold value wouldn't suffice to read the information. With inverse thresholding, it's similar to binary, except now you'd highlight what's in the foreground in white and you highlight your background as black. For our use case, we use local or adaptive thresholding. And the name may give away a little bit of what this actually does. In local thresholding, a window is applied and moved through the original image pixel values. That window is known as a local window or local location. For each local location, a new threshold value is determined based on the pixels existing within that window. In this case, depending on the amount of windows which we apply to our before. Uh, image, you'd have different threshold values being used. So in an example where you may have an image which is unevenly lit, adaptive or local thresholding will ab uh, be able to apply their thresholding application in a more uniform manner. So in the last image, which we showed after thresholding, we do see a more readable and a more enhanced image. Uh, possibly through the presentation, it may look a little bit blurry, but it's more enhanced. The SITSOF is a good application uh, to save our images, especially if it's in receipts. We can take a picture of our original receipt, have it enhanced, and potentially save that uh, alongside each other. Varosha and I wanted to use the thresholded, the final pre-processed image in another use to see the possibilities which exist. So one of the UK cases we applied a threshold image to is OCR detection. OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition and simply put, it's used to extract text from images. In this case, we use Python's Tesseract uh, library. On screen, we see three different uh, pieces of information. In the first 
image, the detection column, we see the output of our pre-processing techniques with some green on, on the text. So here we used a method called image to data. And this simply puts bounding boxes around text which is detected in your image. This is a good way to visually interpret whether the OCR that you're applying to your image has rich enough or clear data. This application is a way to PC our thresholding applications and our pre-processing pipelines to show us that the OCR library can in fact detect text which is present. The second method on screen called image to string simply takes the green bounding boxes which were detected previously and attempts to extract data in the form of a string. And that's what you see in the extraction column. In the extraction column, this data can be interpreted as raw, just a lot of string data. Now, from here, it would take a little bit of regular expressions and string handling. And when we apply that to this data, we were able to, for our use case, extract only the items purchased on this receipt alongside the costs. Of course, with a more complex receipt and more complex string handling and regular expressions, you may be able to extract more information. So that was just a quick one use case which Varosha and I applied. But there are further potential use cases which will allow you to integrate with other services which could lead to quite cool enhancements. In the first line, we have recipe ingredient list. For example, say that you use your Excel sheet on Google Drive to store recipe items for a meal. If you take a picture of your receipt, use the pre-processing pipeline to enhance it, and then OCR to extract the recipe items or simply put the items that you purchased from the receipt, you could integrate with your Excel sheet on Google Drive and update an inventory of items needed for your recipe. A second use case and something that more of us will be familiar with is item warranty notification. In here, again, from your pre-processing image, we would extract the text present and we would try and interpret uh, possibly with a language model or just a list of electronic items, whether there's a particular an item on your receipt, which generally comes with a warranty. If so, we can ping the user with some sort of input, whether this item has a warranty, and if so, the duration. And if you, for example, buy a toaster with a 12-month warranty, input with some integrations, you could create a Google Calendar reminder 12 months from now that your item would reach its warranty period. And lastly, I think the main application is to simply store your receipts. You can store your receipt, your answer receipt, alongside the original picture of your receipt. Moreover, if you are doing storages online, you could categorize them depending on the store you bought it from or the month shown on the receipt. So with any project, Working with image processing and OpenCV library, there's also limitations. And we think it's important to understand your limitations and attempt to cater for it. Yeah, so with any project, there comes limitations and open, uh, using OpenCV or image processing, it's, there's no difference. So when you understand your limitations, you're able to understand your use case and the extent to which you should cater for in your use case. The first limitation, and I think the biggest limitation to using input images, especially receipts, which is something we work with on a daily, is that the, the quality of your input image greatly determines the success of your pipeline. If we were to example, use this image pre-processing pipeline on, for example, medical claim images, these may be images which we're less likely to have in these conditions. But since we are applying it now to just general receipts, these conditions are more likely to occur. In the first two instances, with dim lighting and bright lighting, 
there does exist some OpenCV and Python libraries where you can use equalization to improve the quality of the image and standardize the pixel intensity values. And it will almost look as if the image has been taken in a well-lit environment. When it comes to torn and wet images, these may not suffice to be able to pull enough information from. Sure, you can enhance it, but there's gonna be information which you lose. In terms of a crumpled image, they're simply images which you may not be able to pull enough information from. Again, a lot of us here are problem solvers and saying that a crumpled image is impossible to pull information from would be completely wrong. For example, if there exists a, in this case, it's a SPA deep learning model which was released, which was chained in every single SPA receipt which was created, using that model and leveraging some techniques, you could be able to restore the receipt. And that itself is a restoration pipeline. And lastly, just to, again, summarize the limitations. The first point, again, speaks to the previous slide where your input conditions greatly determine the success of your pipeline. In our investigation or our use case, we wanted to explore the pre-processing pipeline which can be used as a possible receipt enhancement technique, uh, which is why we use a more or less well-lit image. If you're using images that are squashed, and torn, that would be a limitation, but that comes in the compute intensive limitation, which I'll speak about now. When you're speaking about compute can be intensive, I think the most obvious thing we can think about is that images come in different qualities. And in this case, since we are working at a pixel level, if you're using a high quality image, that just means more pixels per inch. So compute can be intensive if you don't apply the right theory which comes with a little bit of experience and reading. For example, in our pipeline, which we use for the receipt, you may have noticed the first step was grayscaling, which then we applied our pipeline, got the contours and so on. But a general uh, start, starting step is to downscale your image. And why is that? If we just want the contour of an image, you don't need to use the highest quality image. You can downscale your image, find the pixels which make up the contour, upscale those contour pixels and apply that again to your original image and you will still get the high quality region of interest, which is your receipt. Again, a, another point on compute can be intensive. The case is that you should understand and know your pipeline and what lies in your pipeline and outside. For example, in our use case, again, we aim to enhance a receipt image when we looked at some of the limitations of a torn or a wet image, those images can be repaired, but that's more of a restoration pipeline. And if you were to, especially in image processing, try to cater for all of this in one pipeline where you're doing restoration and enhancement, you may find that your restoration pipeline is affecting your enhancement pipeline. So you'd wanna keep that separate and try and get a way to determine, does this input image need restoration? Apply that to restoration and then bring it back to enhancing. And lastly, data validation, and I think this is, is the biggest one. Sure, OCR models are, are pretty good at detecting text, which is visible, easily visible on, on at any image, but ensuring that all images are accommodated is, will require some sort of human in the loop of feedback mechanism now and then. So as you create one pipeline, you would find that you would be successful on nine images out of 10. The tenth image in this case is actually the most important one. You need to understand why that wasn't catered for. Maybe it was lighting. Maybe the, the store used a different type of font or color. So data validation requires a lot of human in the loop. And this is not just an application that you can just set a loose um, and go live with. Just at any point, there's a lot of um, updates which you can make to it. So yes, thanks everyone. That brings us to the end of our presentation where we took you guys through some image pre-processing techniques, which we applied to receipts and images to enhance the readability. We provided you with what that resulting threshold or enhanced image looked like. We did discuss a little bit of use cases and we took it through a quick OCR use case, which we applied to our image. Thank you. Some 
Thank you so much. Um, anyone with uh, any questions? Oh, over there. Here you are. Good. Thanks. So my question is, um, how would you tell uh, the type of pipeline that an image through? Like whether telling it's okay for crumbled receipts, go pipeline one, for low dim receipts, go pipeline two, like that initial decision part. Okay, I'll take a stab at your question. So uh, for those of you who di didn't clearly get that, uh, the gentleman asked, if you had to have multiple pipelines, uh, for example, I spoke about a restoration pipeline and our enhancement pipeline. If you were to save compute, for example, how would you determine which pipelines are necessary for your input image? So in this case, I think you can leverage a little bit of machine learning and models. If you do have models and, in, and a data set which is good enough and trained on, for example, wet images, or a model which can detect whether moisture is present in paper, you could use something like that. So in my opinion, I think a mo models which are trained in specific data sets would be most useful. Uh, comment. Is that that fine? Uh, next question, any other? Okay, any other, other, other questions? Anyway, maybe on online? Uh, uh, looks like nothing. Okay. Cool. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Another question over there. Okay, thanks. Uh, I want to ask something. Yes. Have you seen the receipt from macro and how long it is? Uh, so how do you deal with those ones? Yeah, yeah. So the question here was, uh, macro receipts are necessarily long, how would we take a picture of that? How would we process it? Um, yeah, so I'd give my opinion first. So of course, I don't think we're gonna lay the macro receipt down and take one picture. Uh, enhancing that would be cool, but nobody wants to store that. I think in this case, again, like what we did with the receipts, a lot of the pre-processing techniques was region of interest. Visually, we know the receipt is on the table. We want to, try and tell our application the receipt is on the table and can we extract this region of interest? I think with a macro receipt, and even when we look at it, our region of interest has nothing to do with whatever's on the top or bottom. Probably it's just the items present, the date, the store, and maybe your cashier. So I think perhaps macro, you'd create your own pipeline to try and say, okay, if it's a macro receipt, change your region of interest to be more particular. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Can we get another round of applause, please? Thank you. We're going to do a, have a quick intermission before the next one. Thank you, guys. Well, uh, and I think just as a closing note, you guys can, can walk in the meantime. Uh, in light of PyCon, uh, Varosha and I wanted to allow you guys to play around with the code. So we are putting together a Kaggle notebook. We'll make that available possibly on LinkedIn. And we'll run some soft competitions with the use cases we have. If you're able to fork our, our Kaggle notebook, maybe use a data set that we present you with and try and integrate to the Google Drive as well, you feel free to do so. And maybe do a macro pre-processing pipeline. Okay, thank you. <laughs>